I will go ahead and get started. I just wanted to mention that Professor Balk has very graciously agreed to speak with um, graduate students and postdocs after her presentation. So if you have uh, any more in-depth questions, feel free to hold off on those for our uh, student meet and greet afterwards. So um, Professor Deborah Balk is Professor of Public Affairs in the Marx School of Public and International Affairs at Baruch College and at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York and Director of the SUNY Institute of Demographic Research. She was a 2016 Art Andrew Carnegie Fellow and, as you have just heard, she is also an alumna of Berkeley Demography. Using a spatial demographic lens combining population and remote sensing data, Professor Balk studies a wide range of demographic and health outcomes, poverty, and vulnerability. She is a pioneer in the spatial modeling of urbanization and was the lead developer of the Global Rural Urban Mapping Project, GRUMP, and co-director of the first global low elevation coastal zone data sets, which allowed for the estimation of urban population at risk of climate change hazards. She currently serves as co-chair of the New York City Panel on Climate Change's fourth assessment, as a member of the Society and Economy Working Group of the New York State Climate Impacts Assessment, as a member of the U.S. Census Bureau's Scientific Advisory Committee, and as a member of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Population. At present, Professor Balk is working on a project on demographic forecasting of spatial urban population growth with collaborators at the Population Council and the University of Colorado Boulder, and with partners from the population centers at the universities of Colorado, Minnesota, Washington, and El Colegio de Mexico. She is developing a virtual population climate change center that aims to be inclusive to all conducting research or teaching that examines the connections between population and climate change in North America. Without further ado, please join me in giving Professor Balk a very warm welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, it is a real pleasure to be here. Um, it's a, um, yes, so I have, um, uh, I have prepared a very like messy high order set of slides that go through current work and how I've gotten to some of this current work. And I see it a little bit as um, my goal is to be um, a bit of a motivational <laughs> speech for um, us demographers to take spatial considerations and um, more seriously as we move forward in our methods and constructs and framing of demographic questions. Um, and so, as Paloma just mentioned, um, we have, um, you know, we just a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, four colleagues and I from different uh, institutions uh, building on the finding a silver lining in all the pandemic Zoom seminars have been meeting to try to construct a virtual population and climate change center, which would be aimed at bringing together not only researchers, but advanced graduate students and postdocs to help uh, both in population sciences, but also in climate to help bridge these fields because very few of us ever have, um, you know, we're lucky if we can teach, uh, I've been uh, since I've been at CUNY for uh, 16 years now or so, I have twice taught a class on population and climate change to graduate to doctoral students. And, um, you know, that's the kind of class I'm lucky to be able to teach it, but it doesn't run very frequently. And um, and similarly, when I have a question about a new po a new data set to use that I'm concerned about a particular climate variable or for perhaps thinking about errors that are introduced in the survey data that I might be using. These questions really arise when you try to put them in these frames. And so I, I think we have a lot of work ahead of us. And so my little, so the whole talk, it could be seen as a motivational speech to make for us in the demographic and population and health community to make our own, um, uh, our own approaches to research more accessible to the climate community and to integrate climate factors where appropriate to any given question at hand. So um, I'm going to talk particularly about coastal hazards today because that's where I have some new work on that. But I can just start with we have uncertainties in an uncertain time. But with those uncertainties, we have some demographic certainties. Like the here is the we know we're in, uh, in the future of the world will be increasingly urban and increasingly old. And there's a lot to be said for that. Like we um, and we do a pretty we do a, a good job of understanding. Um, aging and a lot of people in this room have been uh, for uh, mul many decades been pushing have been uh, uh, putting forward new ways of thinking about aging and that's a really important component to this we've done less well on the urban 
urban side. Um, and for reasons I'm happy to talk about, but I don't so much have them here, but I have some perhaps ways of thinking about answers to um, understanding urbanization in demographic terms, as opposed to exclusive, uh, either in um, uh, more land-based terms. Uh, similarly, um, climate change, in terms of climate change, we know that most places will be on average hotter. There will be more variability in weather. There will be more, uh, many places will be more flood prone and stormier, and they will similarly be drier. So you can be more flood prone and more drought prone at the same time. And, and very frequently those two, uh, you know, coexist. So, um, and we can, these are things that we can expect in um, many places. Um, just to um, framing the, these, these uh, constructs are demographic data, or as everybody here knows, right? They get them from censuses, surveys, administrative and vital events records. They're either individual or aggregated data, but they're almost, you know, to say they're not always spatial is to say that they are mostly not spatial. And increasingly we retrofit these data to put them in space, but we don't think about spatial considerations typically when we generate a demographic data set which I would argue is a problem. Climate data, for example, on the other hand, um, a lot of it is point source observation. Frequently it's modeled. They then end up in something called a grid, which is, um, I'll talk about that in a minute, but that's continuous space on the Earth's surface, has no names or administrative areas attached to it, makes it a little hard to work with if you're not trained to work with those data. Those data are almost always spatial. And so then you have to find ways to integrate these data. And uh, those data either are rather coarse or very local. And so in both of those ways, they're not so compatible with what we uh, think about in terms of demographic data, which are representative at a national level, sometimes subnational level, or a very uh, or a particular locality. So um, so just the, those these uh, so in contrast, the data, the data really make it obvious why sometimes uh, as a community of scholars where there aren't a whole lot of people who want to uh, work in this space. Um, but I would argue that there are new opportunities for demography. And in this image here, um, as you, you can see my pointer maybe, right? Can you see my pointer over my screen? Yeah, so I'm gonna assume that's a yes. So, okay, good. So we have here, we have, um, this is Bangladesh. So, and Ayesha was at this, uh, we had a recent meeting of that virtual population climate change initiative that we're trying to get um, off the ground. We had a very sort of preliminary meeting to bring in some people and we had a, a, um, invited Ayesha to attend it. So sorry, she's not here, um, but you know, here's a map of Bangladesh instead. <laughs> um, so here we have, um, and for those of you who don't know, which is probably most people, but a few people on this phone know that I, um, you know, I wrote my dissertation on uh, gender inequality and its uh, and fertility in Bangladesh. So um, I started in Bangladesh and I still think about Bangladesh. Um, but um, so here we see Bangladesh um, and the blue blobs over it are something that um, this acronym LECZ is a low elevation coastal zone, which I will describe um, a little bit in a minute. Um, and then we have a um, overlaying it um, here in the these dots that we see over here and looking closely at DACA are um, demographic behavior, which we can derive from DHS census data. So those are the color dots in here. The two different colors show up two different years of the um, DHS. And then um, the these black hues here represent urbanization that we derive from built up area data from the global human settlement layer data, which is mostly from the Landsat archive, but increasingly there's a new higher resolution data set of Sentinel data, which is improving. A lot of this is driven by machine learning algorithms and so forth. And as I'll describe in a bit, the really exciting thing about these data is they go back to 1975. And so um, they are now becoming um, the basis for a what we would consider a proper time series <laughs> so that we can use it, for example, to help forecast future population. Um, so the grayscale here shows year 2000 and then the color bits like in the yellow shade show percentage point changes to 2014. Um, and, and these are overlaid here with um, wealth scores from the DHS. So the different colors here show the dem uh, and we see more wealth inside the what we recognize as DACA. And as we move out to the periphery, we find lower levels of the wealth score. And some of that, of course, is how the wealth score is measured, but not all of that. So anyhow, these, 
I'm showing this, this is not, this research is published. I'm gonna refer back to it at the end. Um, I wanna make the point here that uh, I'm trying to impress upon um, you the, that we have these new kinds of data, both the uh, elevation data set that go into making the low elevation coastal zone data set, but the low elevation coastal zone is, is itself a data set and the global human settlement layer is its own built up data set plus another entire industry of people using it to create uh, a data set called the degree of urbanization data set. These are happening whether or not we decide to engage with them uh, as a community of scholars. And I would argue that we, the more we engage with them, the more demographically informed and demographically useful those data sets will be. And it doesn't matter if you work in micro data space or macro data space these data can be retrofit to work with both kinds of data. So here I've shown microdata from the DHS survey, and I'm now gonna, I'll come back to this toward the end, but I'm gonna um, show you um, a little bit more about some using uh, census aggregates to estimate population exposure in the low elevation coastal zone. So, um, and so this is, was to answer who's at risk of seaward hazards. So, um, uh, so the short answer is people who live connected to sea coast and those increasingly impacted coastal storms are people um, uh, who are impacted by it, but the exposure is really uneven. Urban dwellers are disproportionately at risk, uh, but we know almost nothing about whether there are any other population compositional um, exposures or the young or the elderly or the poor or the women. Now we do know after a major flood event that the exposure is likely to and uh, um, affect people uh, some popul some groups disproportionately like the elderly and um, women and the young are in fact um, more likely to be um, at risk of uh, mortality from after um, a major flood event except in the case of where there are also men engaged in fisheries and then they have occupational hazards. But we don't have the data at a global scale to address this. So importantly, this work, um, for those of you who aren't, that don't pay close attention to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's a major project that involves, you know, uh, the, uh, the sixth assessment of the IPCC has just come out. The fourth assessment, so roughly about 13 years ago, the fourth assessment was underway. And the way that assessment works, they assess all the literature, including gray literature. And if there's something that, but they won't assess like pre-publication work, for example. And the word urban basically did not appear in the IPCC early assessments, in the assessments one through three. The fourth assessment was the first time it appeared, and it appeared in the context of understanding that populations were at risk of seaward hazards, as I'm about to show. So, and that work has been really important. Now the IPCC, the sixth assessment, has a whole chapter on urban, and it has much more uh, focus on sort of understanding also some aspects of population composition and population vulnerabilities. And those are big improvements, I think. Um, so this has been, uh, this work has been put that, put that on their radar, but in addition to that, um, uh, lots of, even as that global uh, work progresses, all for adaptation or mitigation planning, most of that work has to happen at a local, um, at the local level or at a regional scale. And those, um, sometimes those present, um, let's say challenges uh, in uh, the kind of data requirements that one might need to operate in those two settings. So, okay, so this is uh, work that was originally developed uh, again, 13 years ago, 14 years ago. Um, and we estimated for the first time that, um, and this is just a pie um, chart showing the persons living in the low elevation coastal zone by continent. You can see Asian dwellers are at risk. And one in 10 person lives in this low elevation coastal zone, which is defined as, um, 10 meter, up to 10 meters contiguous to sea coast. So it's elevation up to 10 meters contiguous to sea coast, um, which, um, and so um, in most countries with any land area had their largest city in it and small island states and deltaic countries and their cities at much higher risk. That's what we found, uh, you know, the first time we did this. But when we then go further to subdivide it into urban people and rural people, so to speak, we found that one in eight urban persons lives in the LECZ. And this was the first time that urban, um, that there was a spatial delineation of urban people. So all these data, I'll show you the ingredients of how you, you get here. Um, but 
Importantly, we find that um, city dwellers in Africa and Asia are disproportionately at risk. You can see the total population is just 7% in Africa and 13% in Asia, but the, of the urban population, it's 12 and 18%. And pretty much elsewhere, it's pretty close to evenly distributed across it, including the small island states that have been, uh, you know, that were very important in the early assessments in pushing some of this, these agendas. Uh, but the reason the Africa and Asia disproportionate urban dwellers is really important is because most of the future growth of population is going to take place in the cities and towns of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So, so this is a really simple method, but it depends on the quality of the data, both on the demographic data and the um, satellite imagery. So the first data set, this is a bunch of administrative boundaries for Vietnam. These are coming level data for Vietnam. The red blobs are nighttime lights circa, there was a stable city light data product circa 1995, and that's what's used here. Um, I'm not going to talk about it in any detail. This is the Grump data set, which has been supplanted by other additional newer satellites that I'll show in a minute. But this allowed us to identify urban areas in Vietnam or globally. And then we used low elevation coastal zone from the uh, shuttle radar topography mission, which itself also was um, circa ran in the year 2000. And to date, it's the only elevate, it's the main elevation data set upon which products like this are developed. So there are, there's now increasing attention to complexities like high water lines and other things like that. But um, at a local scale, we can do that Glenn, globally, not so well. So here population you see is measured in these irregular units that we're familiar with and we you know use them in tables all the time. But the underlying spatial resolution of these small units, they vary by country and year. And in case just in point, Vietnam in 19 in 2009 had these fine, made these fine-grained data publicly available. And the following decade, um, they did not. <laughs> they they coarsened their data and they made them available. And that's a real problem when, okay, here in, in Southern Vietnam, there's a very large area, but right here, it's very narrow band. And if you're trying to estimate the population at risk across these tiny bands, you really want finely resolved data. So we transform these data to a quadrilateral grid. So every cell is uniform. And then we do a, the simplest of all possible statistics. You just like, it's like a cookie cutter, you overlay them. The finer your underlying data in the grid, the more precise your, you know, your estimate can be. And it's called a zonal statistic. And a lot, but then you can re put, you can put these together into uh, any spatial unit you want. But the important thing here is that like this approach, which I just showed the, in those pie charts, we can only do primarily for population at a global scale. Counts of population, therefore we can do counts and densities and nothing else pretty much. No, but of course other attributes matter as I was um, saying. Now those kind of um, uh, data um, have, the same, uh, you know, I'm going to come back to this this slide in a minute. I'll come, I will, um, I'll come back to that one. That's uh, when I talk about cities, so a little bit more. So um, there have been, um, so since this, these first, this analysis first appeared, there have been improvements to the measurement of that low elevation coastal zone, allow us, allowing us to distinguish between like zero to five meters and five to 10 meters uh, contiguous to coast. And just to put that in, uh, in context, um, it turns out that, um, New York City, for example, uses a five meter uh, emergency management. That's what the Department of Emergency Management in New York City uses for its uh, uh, short and medium term planning for uh, disaster response. And so zero to five is pretty up to five meters is a pretty reasonable estimate. A lot of people say sea level is never going to rise up to 10 meters. What do you care about that? Like, that's just way too, that's crazy. But in fact, as an outer envelope, when zero to five becomes um, you know, flooded, people will probably move near, I mean, there's a good chance people move into the five to 10 and there's a lot of infrastructure and certainly storms care a whole lot less about elevation, uh, whether it's five to 10, because they don't come in from seacoast, but they of course do, are, storms do occur in these coastal patterns that do, and it affects other things like runoff and so forth, which is a little bit out of my domain, but it, uh, these things, turns out they do matter. So um, there's also new measures, measures of urbanization, which allows for distinguish, distinguishing urban areas along a continuum, not just urban and rural, which I've been harping about for a very long time. And it also allows us to characterize the built up density of location, which is useful if you wanna look at uh, proxies for potentially things like subnational GDP or other assets at risk in addition to population distributions. And then importantly, um, uh, we have change over time, which looks at uh, now um, 
1990 to 2015 um, for um, for these uh, uh, for many of these measures, so we can use um, temporally varying measures of population in urban areas, which were previously in the first thing unavailable. And we can ask, has the LECZ grown faster, and have the urban areas in the LECZ grown faster? The only limitation is that the LECZ itself is only for the year 2000. But I think that of all of these data sets, it's the least likely to change over time. So. Um, so these are an example. So there are now four different data sets to that we can use to measure the elevation. I'm going to show a small animation of one of these in a minute to give you the temporal dimension. These are the four data sets for to measure the LECZ or for this urban continuum, which is where we as a community of scholars could really contribute quite a bit. And then also the population grid stuff has left the door, but every person graduating from a demography program should know what population grids are heavily dominated by geographers, but with lots of assumptions and uh, including many that are potentially endogenous if you want to use these data in some of these models that are used. And you can see that um, just looking over the population, um, the population grids, there's quite a bit of difference between these four data sets. So I'm going to show a sensitivity analysis in a minute. This blobby one here was the Grump data set originally that we had, um, and these others are greater are now improvements to that that use more refined satellite measures, both whether it's from lights or from these built up areas. And those are the two ways: either you, met, you measure electrification or you measure basically impervious surface that isn't road. Um, so, okay, so this is what the low elevation coastal zone looks like for Bangkok. Um, this is up to five meters, um, and this is up to ten meters. And the corrections in the new data set. So there have been important corrections and allows us to make these distinctions, which I think are substantial. There is some tension because they're under five is a little less, um, there's greater uncertainty with it, but, there, but there's a tension between the policy and planning communities that really want it in the science community. So it's, we consider it suggestive, but not definitive. Um, then there's urbanization. So this global human settlement layer data has been combined with, um, has been created now the, there's a, a, a settlement model that's been used to create a continuum of urban classes going from very rural and you know sparsely populated all the way up to dense, um, dense, um, densely settled used by using both two, two basic inputs by using the built up area data and the population, the coarse population grids and moves it around and then you can get, and this is just showing it collapse to three areas. Here are urban centers, which are, and then these are what are, uh, we're calling urban clusters at a global scale. It's really hard to know what these clusters are. They include everything from possibly towns, suburbs, peri-urban areas, tiny little like vill villages that are starting to become more urban. So these are the places where we might expect urban change to take place. Um, but it's the most heterogeneous of all these categories. The red areas, pretty much cities as we know them. Um, so, but. Um, and this is collapsing that categorization of seven into three. And then not shown, the white areas are the remaining rural and sparsely settled places. And then, so these classes, uh, they use a density construct, um, uh, of, uh, which is um, 1,500 persons per square kilometer or a population greater than um, 50,000 persons to be in an urban center. And the quasi-urban centers have uh, pop densities of less than uh, 300 persons per square kilometer and a population of 5,000. And in fact, in the US, that's still too high. Lots of our suburban areas actually don't even meet that criteria. Um, and so, and that becomes an issue. So this is this was 1990, and then this is change over time for 20 uh, to 2015. So quite a bit of growth. Um, and then now we overlay it with the low elevation coastal zone and we see that most of the everybody who lives in Bangkok is at some kind of whether they're in the five meter or on up to 10 meter zone they are at um, they face some risks associated with uh, seaward hazards so um, and then on the method reallocates pop data and I would mention this already I'll carry on. Okay, so finally, the population distribution. This is one data set that, is, that we use. This shows us change to 2015. Um, and then again, overlaid with the low elevation coastal zone, but we have to use all three of those, the pop grid, the urban grids, and this uh, sea level, this low elevation coastal zone grid to then come up with new estimates. Um, and um, so frequently, and this is a pop, this is a problem in this community. It's a really pain in the neck to like if national censuses were more engaged in producing small area estimates and gridding them, it'd be a whole lot easier for people downstream to 
make use of them. But in fact, you know, this is not, they don't see this as their main mandate. They think of producing the data and let other people use it. What happens is frequently these global data products take into account, they redistribute population by elect by the night lights. And then if you want to use it with the night lights data set to indicate something about economic growth, well, then you would have potentially, you're putting people where you know people are because you're introducing endogeneity from the get-go. So it's really important to know what goes in. So this particular model is uh, one of the more simpler ones that we're using here to try to get around some of that. So, um, um, and then they also are, for poor countries, both night lights and these built-up area data are probably still biased. Uh, again, you know, they're more likely to find such locations in wealthier countries. So in a nutshell from this like reanalysis of these data, we find these are looking at variation on um, populations by these, these are, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these. These are the four different data sets. So this coastal DEM data sets assigns more people to zero to five. So, it, so there is variation. One data set in particular puts a lot of people under five meters. All the others are much more consistent with the populations that they put. This is land area that I'm showing, but it's true also for population. The other thing that's important here is that um, only one of these data sets is, can be publicly redisseminated. So if you wanna produce data that people, other people can use, you sort of lean in the direction of the one, and if that's this one here called Merit DEM. I think it's a reasonable choice. The SRTM was the one that we used in the original study and it's much improved. So, um, so then we, the, but now putting them, so these are the same four data sets that we're showing here by these different elevation zones. And by, this is the, whether it's up to five meters, five to 10 or outside the LECZ. And each one of these dots shows the popula uh, one of the different population models that we're using. And with the one exception of the coastal DEM, there's a lot of consistency across the population data products. Um, and the estimates are more sensitive to the choice of the low elevation coastal zone model than they are to the choice of the population model, which is a good thing in a way because um, you wouldn't want the population data sets to, they, they, they make different modeling assumptions about the, in, the low, in the coastal zone. So, and then along the urban continuum, one data set, the one actually that I favor in for a variety of reasons, because it has the longest time series, does concentrate people in urban and quasi urban areas more than others, and um, and for known reasons, the coarsest data set puts more people in rural areas because of its assumption that there's uniform distribution. So the settlement estimates, like a little bit like the elevation estimates, are really sensitive to data source. Now, the community of people who produce these urban continuum data sets are not primarily us. A few of them are urban planners. They're mostly physical scientists. They're not thinking along the social constructs in which we would maybe think about some of these things. So again, it's an area of um, possible engagement. So in a nutshell though, taking this assumption and here I'm using, the data set I'm using here is the GHS POP with the SMOD, which is the degree of urbanization data set and the Merit DEM uh, in this result. So now I've got rid of all the sensitivity analysis and here I show urban areas have experienced the greatest population growth, this is 90. Um, and urban areas with, but, but importantly, urban areas within the LECZ have grown faster than they have outside. And that's a significant finding and important. Um, so confirming the original findings, we place, you know, about 11% of the global population in this LECZ, but it places even more urban residents and 14% of the population of urban centers, but 10%, nearly 10% of people living in these areas that are like quasi-urban, these peri-urban places. Um, and um, the population of the quasi-urban uh, clusters and rural areas are evenly split between the lower elevation, the higher risk zone and the moderate risk zone, whereas the big cities tend to be at somewhat higher elevation. Um, it may be importantly for existing, like maybe that is some evidence of historical adaptation. But this is important because it's these places that in the quasi-urban clusters are probably at risk of in situ um, urbanization and change. So um, importantly as well, 61% of the population of the LECZ lives in an urban center as opposed to 47% beyond it. And, uh, but like when you look at the land, only 12% of the land is in one of these two areas as opposed to 2% of the land beyond it. So it's really concentrated. But uh, quasi-urban areas, again, for people who pay attention to climate and the way we organize our life, um, 
these quasi urban areas occupy quite a bit more land and have more people than everywhere inside or outside the LECZ. Um, but then again, important because these are the places that are likely to tra be transformed. Um, population density, just important to note that population densities have increased in the LECZ, uh, probably because those areas have had faster growth. Um, and so, and in fact, they at least in, 20, in 2015, roughly 320 persons per square kilometer in, were in the, um, in the LECZ, um, whereas about a little more than fit, about 55% outside of it. So, and the likely causes are probably the LECZ's disproportionate urban nature combined with urban population growth and this in situ urbanization and expansion of urban land. Um, though sometimes when you have expansion of urban land, it actually lowers density because you add people who are living more sparsely compared to deep urban areas. There are regional differences. So each of these uh, colored bar represents uh, the red are cities, the, ye the, the yellows are towns and semi-dense areas, and the red ones are the um, yellow, the green ones are rural. And um, the black bars um, are the where the uh, level in uh, 1990 and the colored bars are 2015. So whereas um, the biggest change in population growth is occurring in LECVs and disproportionately so in cities. And so this is probably occurring because there's actually just, um, these are transitioning from one category to another. So um, uh, like we're not actually looking at the specific place-based change in this um, regard. So uh, we can also look at these by, um, by under five meters and over five meters. And some, just again, concentrating on Asia for a minute, there are cities at risk everywhere, but especially in Asia, zero to five elite meter LECZ, many are large cities like Bangkok, Dhaka, Kolkata, Saigon, they're all, and these are all situated in deltas. So yet another thing that we in the social science community really don't pay much attention to, which is like who lives in a delta? Right, like who cares, right? Well, much of those, much of the LECZ is deltaic. Roughly a third of people who have this coastal exposure and hazard, um, slightly uh, more than a third live in a delta. Those are largely in Asia, as we can see here. Those are the big outlines, and the the shades are the LECZ themselves. A, a largely, they're in cities, and the proportion of the population in the five to ten zone is growing inside and outside the delta. It seems at roughly the same rates, but at these low levels, at zero, in, uh, at zero to five, it's growing faster in these deltaic areas in LECZs than beyond it. And that's also important because these are places that are, in additionally, these low areas are at risk of greater subsidence and sinking, making their risks of um, exposure, their hazards are even potentially greater. That works underway. So importantly, um, urban giants, you know, so many of them are in, as I just pointed out, so this is a map, the red ones show where some of them are in India, China, and elsewhere in Asia, and India and China alone have 15 and eight cities respectively, greater than 5 million. And um, some of them are not coastal, but many of them are. And the ones that aren't coastal, by the way, have other issues like associated with uh, drought and so forth. So uh, data choices do matter. The data choices can lead to differences in estimation of population exposure to potential sea level rise and coastal hazards. Improved census data would go a long way to reduce some of the uncertainties. If you're going to use these data, think about your fitness of use and respective use cases for using it. And those are some of this is described in a recent paper. But despite major differences, every source we evaluated shows that the, the LECZ is disproportionately urban. Urban population in the LECZ is growing at a faster rate than we see outside of it. But causes of urban growth in the LECZ remain, or anywhere, pretty much remain unanswered. So, and now it's time to reflect, like, why is that on us? Like, and if we go to, um, like, if we look to the UN, they can't help us because their estimates of urban areas is just a connect the dots approach. So, uh, right, it's just a straight linear interpolation. So we wanna know whether it land expansion of uh, existing cities or the emergence of new urban areas is contributing to the growth. We wanna know what is the role of migration versus natural increase is unknown and answers to this would assist in climate adaptation as well as understanding differential exposures. So um, I just, uh, before moving on, I want to um, note that the, uh, this approach that I've just showed is applicable to any spatially delineated hazards like heat, uh, drought, wildfires, inland flooding, which we haven't spent a lot of time on. Those data aren't great, but they're getting better. And notably, the remote sensing and environmental data are becoming more and more avail available and more transparent and so on. 
And the measures of vulnerability, however, have to come from censuses and surveys. And so I, I think that it's you know, incumbent upon us in our, uh, our own communities of uh, you know, um, science or practice to be paying attention to improving those data sets. So the global data sets, uh, they focus on council population. New models now are coming out that includes pop population by age and sex, but again, it's kind of a course modeling approach. So again, underlying data would to go a long way. And of course, any data on vulnerability would help a lot too. That's more specifically like housing characteristics, uh, for example, wealth or poverty characteristics, these things would go a long way. Um, land, landedness and so on. So um, I would, um, importantly, and this is a really a separate other talk, so I won't go into it in great detail, the global estimates of uh, urbanization or the global estimates that we're looking at have focused on the past and present, but models for population forecasting are not spatial. And as most of the change centers around city growth, we need to, I would argue, understand spatially uh, the spatial aspects of forecasting. And we know that city growth is driven mostly by fertility and migration from some earlier work that I have done with Mark Montgomery. Um, but our statistics are really not collected at scales easily compatible with that. And we also know that migration um, is rural to urban migration is on the decline, but urban to urban migration is on the rise. So we do a pretty good job at the national level of getting people when they cross borders, maybe not perfect, but much better. But we don't do so it's a great job of getting of measuring internal migration or um, time frames that are anything other than kind of a you know 10, five and 10 year time frame. So this is particularly important for understanding which cities are growing and how in spatial, both in spatial and demographic terms. So um, I would argue that so new forecasting methods are needed. So, and we now have some resources to that we're working with to a multi-level spatial model of growth that combines spatial um, and subnational demographic data with regional spatial statistical models include demographic processes, fertility, mortality, migration to model urban or city growth. And something like this is a really simple equation, a growth model, right? That includes something like fertility, uh, mortality migration, and it's a spatial model. So we have some terms for spatial dependence and so forth. But I want to point out that, you know, maybe uh, with Tim Miller's uh, suggestion, we're actually looking at the child woman ratio instead of fertility. It has the advantage that it lets us look at um, mortality as well. Uh, pretend, you know, it's implicit in it and it covers a little bit about mortality and certainly more available in most countries. Um, and then we may be using local downscaling models for distributing these growth scenarios, such as gravity models, which are pretty common in geography. So, and then we, and the, these models that we're, what we're predicting here is the spatial growth of the built up area data that I have showed at the very first slide. We're not, that is the very first thing we do that first, then we put in these, these other characteristics. So, uh, and right now people just use like cellular automata and just say, go, okay, these cities are growing. So all the current work on land development and urbanization is primarily done from la with land focus without taking into account any demographic characteristics. And if a demographic characteristic is taken into account, it's pop density and nothing more. So, um, so we will treat uh, urban land from satellites and population processes as loosely coupled in this. And here in this model here, this is built up area versus Mexico City. And there's this now time series that's from 1975 to 2020. And that's so it's a promising way of uh, sort of integrating these data so that we can get at urbanization. Um, so because we don't know where this growth will occur and um, we don't know if it's gonna be on this periphery of cities and new ones, whether it's vertical, that's still a hard part for us to get at. And getting at slums, you'd think that with satellite imagery, we could do a better job of understanding slums and informal settlement. We could in some places, but we don't have a global way of doing that yet. And as I previously said, we don't have the causes of city growth, whether they're natural increase or migration, especially internal or even reclassification of these areas. Um, so, but we can't really understand city growth without understanding migration as well as fertility. So, um, and the composition matters. So, um, and so we're using, this is just a, we, the gray countries we're also paying attention to, but when you mention this, people say, oh, you can never get those data. But in fact, the DHS data and the IPAMS uh, collection of data are great for subnational. So we're using subnational fertility or child woman ratios right now to get, um, to try to estimate, um, to put into this uh, at first order administrative unit and perhaps we'll go down deeper. We don't need to go all the way down to the pixel level because nobody expects these processes to be moving, to be operating at the pixel level per se, if they're fine grained. 
Um, I just want to point out that I wanted to go back briefly and I'm close to the end, so I'm not paying attention to the time. Okay, I'm over time. I was told not to go over time. So though we did this early on, this uh, there's a high appetite for some of this work here. So with a colleague who's an ecologist who paid, who had a water database, Mark Montgomery and I paid attention to, sorry, I should have just left the slides. So here, yes. So this it looks at urban water shortage. It uses all those same ingredients and in we did a very coarse, we just used national level fertility rates to forecast uh, the grump data for city growth. And we did it consistent with um, both a climate scenario data from the um, uh, IPCC's shared socioeconomic pathways and with freshwater region, with a climate forecast, and then with a demographic, uh, and this demographic model, this early version of the demographic model. And what we find is through, 20, through 2050, all the pressure on urban water comes from population change. And then after that, climate change kicks in. And the regions, again, you see here, the biggest region at risk, which has oddly all these deltas, um, but they're not in the same place. There will be all this water shortage in, largely in South Asia and East Asia. So um, I'm just gonna find where I was to make a, I promised to say a few things that like, yeah, here we are, so close to being done. So uh, just FYI, so here we have from global to local in the US, we can do the same thing in the US. We don't have to rely on global databases. So in the US, uh, and some people have contributed to this work, but they primarily study it at the level of the county, which gives, which is pretty, leads to pretty big misestimates. So of the roughly three, thousand counties in the lower 48, about 13% of them have any land area in the LECZ with more than roughly more 25 million persons at risk. And that's probably an underestimate and I'll be revising that in the next few days. But um, the interesting, the exposure of this is really, really, really concentrated. About 55% of that exposure is in these top 25 counties. Lots of them are in Florida and many of them are in New York. Um, and interestingly, the urban population has been increasing, which I'll get at here. So um, I mean, it, what the, actually, what's true is that the population of the LACZ in the U.S. is roughly 90% are, um, urban, which is greater than the U.S. average. Um, and, um, and so, and these estimates are really best when done with block level census data, which are computationally challenging. But um, notable is that the urban areas are pretty much growing at the same rates inside and outside the LECC, as we see in this bottom graph over, this is between 90 and 2000 and 2010, 2000 and 2010, and we're updating it with some wacky methods for 2020 because the urban characteristic is not part of the public law released version of the census data for blocks courtesy of the differential privacy um, you know um, the set of suite of data that are now available from the US census but notably the urban areas are growing at the same rate but uh, rural areas um, seem to be on the decline so there has been rural decline outside of um, the LE, you know in as we know, rural populations have been declining, but they have been um, declining uh, at either at a more negative rate uh, in the most recent period in the last, you know, from 20 to from year 2000 to 2010 and less fast in the period prior to that. So we're starting to look at these kinds of changes um, and then we're breaking it down by, you know, within greater localities. And here in the case of this is showing for Florida, this is housing units, but we can also look at it by race and ethnicity, which um, to pay attention to climate, uh, to put a climate justice lens on it and, and it's in a racial justice lens. And we find that in the state of Florida, if you're um, white, you're, um, you know, if you're, if you're black or Hispanic, you're much more likely to live in the low elevation coastal zone than you are to live outside of it. And so that puts um, the, uh, persons of color at higher risk as well. And part of that is driven by them being um, by, by the urban concentrations of Black and Hispanic populations in urban centers as opposed to in um, peri-urban and rural areas, and also in the coastal areas as opposed to the center of Florida, which... So just doub doubling back to, the, um, to paying attention to migration in that very first image that I showed, this is a study um, that I did a few years ago, which shows that in Bangladesh, migration using microdata, um, while we divided the LECZ a little bit differently, but while the, um, the higher zone there, which was seven to 10 meters, um, was more built up and lower lying than, um, uh, uh, and it was more built up than lower lying areas 
um, and higher both areas under that or outside the LECZ altogether, it also experienced the highest rate of change in the built up area. So maybe that's again some evidence of historical adaptation, but there's caution because with increasing changes to climate and sea level rise in Bangladesh in particular, the seven to 10 meter LECZ, which is where most of the city, the country's urban residents live will increasingly become the high risk zone. But then importantly, the changes in the built up area are associated um, with reducing poverty in the urban areas, but urban is, um, but so, so suggesting that urbanization may improve well being even in the presence of exposures to seaward hazards, which is really important, right? Like if urbanization makes people better off, I mean, this is if people are moving in harm, moving toward harm's way, so to speak. Um, but um, because they're, they're made better off, right? But poor migrants and migrants from rural areas are indeed more likely to end up in this um, in the cities of the LECZ and particularly the lower lying areas of it than wealthier migrants. And so this is just the um, you know a, a simple picture, but there's a um, a multivariate analysis that backs that from which these results are based. So um, so um, finally, so that I think that leaves room for policy and programs to improve the resiliency of them. Yeah, and I'm done. So, well, okay, well, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, Thank you. So, so we normally stop uh, at one, but since we're running a little late on time, is it okay if we have a couple of questions? Sure. Sorry for going. That's okay. I really tried hard, don't you? But I wasn't watching my clock. That's okay. It's but hard. as you see, there are only like 36 slides. Whoops. So, which is like, you know, so hold on. I'm going to, I can stop sharing. How's that? That would be better. Good. Let's see. Let's, let's start with a question from Jim Carrey. You want to ask a question, Jim? Yeah, I'll ask yeah, you. Okay. Okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah, what do you consider, or what do climate scientists consider the endpoint here um, for sea level rising? And uh, if, for example, would it be when all polar ice melts? And uh, so, whatever that endpoint is, what are the consequences uh, for the coastal city populations? Uh, wait, can you say the last part again? Well, what are the consequences for uh, if the polar ice melted? Let's call out the endpoint. Yeah, so like, I, I, first of all, I don't think climate scientists create an endpoint. They just keep on going. Like the new climate forecasts go out to 20, they go out even beyond 2100. <laughs> so like uh, we're left alone here because like we, right? Like nobody wants to do population forecasts beyond 2100 for the most part. So, um, but the climate, the, and, and there are huge unknowns, right? Like. So I don't think they think about the, it's not so much they're thinking that they have an endpoint, um, but there are things that are increasingly, like they're trying to capture the degree of uncertainty associated with things like ice melt and uh, these like polar caps. And, um, and so, and cities are taking that. So like now new climate forecasts increasingly have these rapid ice melts forecasts in them. So um, some cities are probably at higher risk than others. And I think that's becoming increasingly known. Um, I'm not sure that's tr really an, er an answer to your question, um, but I would say I, I don't think that climate scientists are seeing an endpoint period. They're just they'll continue to move it out, if uh, maybe most importantly. So. And has a question about the other end of the time scale, right now. Oh, about right about, now. about the what about the what time scale? The other end of the time scale. What's happening right now? That's that kind of is providing signals. Are there storm surges and things that are providing signals? Uh, his question. Is is there a way of estimating what proportion of people live in the low zones that have or will soon experience storm surge flooding, and so we'll have an early warning? Yeah, so there are places that are like early warning systems are pretty good for drought. Um, early warning systems are pretty good for storms. Um, connecting like so, this work that I presented is largely global, or it's not site specific. In places like the, there are increasingly um, amount of um, storm surge sensors that are modeling this stuff. So there's that's another community of people who study storm surges. Um, it's like a sub sub field of, um, <clears throat> I guess, of uh, geosciences. And it's very statistically demanding, apparently. Um, but those are, um, I don't think there are storm surge uh, early warning systems yet in place. So, um, but they do know, I mean, increasingly, I think that like cities are paying attention to 
the things that go into these storm surge modeling, like if the particularly high tides, tides are paid close attention to on the event of storms. So um, yeah. Is, so, to make sure follow up, is there a behavioral type? Is it too early to do behavioral studies? Like mean, Sandy, when it destroyed the subways, presumably influenced migration in and out of New York because the subways were so bad, minor example. But there are big storms hitting uh, these low lying regions now. Is this a big area of research? What the behavioral responses are, or are we still? Yeah, in there the is. Area? So there's a there's a fairly recent paper on uh, in. Uh, an econ journal, I don't remember which one, maybe Journal of Economic Perspectives or maybe AER, I don't remember, but showing that uh, the cities that most people don't move after a storm, uh, they return. And we know this also, I mean, in the US, there's a lot of maladaption, what, what people like, might call like FEMA as a policy is pretty maladaptive as a response. So, uh, and, it, and it, it disproportionately, it's mallet. If you're wealthy or like middle income or wealthy, you probably have access to FEMA, a lot of the uh, federal emergency management assistance at, in the wake of a storm. If you're poor, you may have less access to that. And so there is a, again, another uneven aspect to the vulnerability and who's impacted from storms. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, but most people don't want it. First of all, people don't want to move far. I mean, when, when there's a storm, which is why we need to pay attention to this five to 10 meter zone. We find that when people leave a storm or move from a storm or move in the aftermath of a disaster, they want to, they don't want to go far. Also, you know, the economic, the centers of economic activity are not moving very far as well. So people are, most people did not leave New York after Hurricane or Superstorm Sandy. Most people are still here and people who lost their homes or had buyout programs moved nearby. That is what happens to most people that you move near. So, um, so it is not too soon to start. So, but I mean, there's a lot of behavioral work that's being done on it, but it's not mostly being done by people who pay attention to medium and long-term demographic changes or demographic behaviors. It's largely being done by other communities of scholarship. Great. Uh, I think there's one last question from Ron. Do you want to do your methodology question? Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm unmuted, I think. Yes, I uh, can hear you, Ron. I'm wondering if demographers or others are working on these spatially detailed population forecasts that you are saying would be useful, and if they are, how they're doing it, and whether they try to reconcile with national level projections. So the answer to that has been for, I would say, more than 10 years, a lot of buzz, both by like UNFPA that goes into countries with a lot of technical assistance to think about population forecasting to, for subnational countries want subnational population forecasts. Um, and this is where Tim, the conversations with Tim have come in. He's like, people need subnational population forecasts. Who's doing it? You know, so are people, uh, are people want to use cohort component for that? Um, and I think times, I would argue, maybe times have changed and we can uh, like enter in the world of Bayesian forecasting perhaps for these things instead. And the statistical model that I showed for our work is definitely more in the sort of econometric statistical um, Bayesian style approach to do city forecasting. It's also, so people who are working, who are thinking about subnational population, no, the UN is not yet thinking about subnational population forecasting. I think they should be thinking about it, like in really su su substantial ways. Um, and yeah, I can like, you know, have as many side conversations with John Wilmoth about this. I mean, like I've had a lot and I will continue to have more, but I don't think it's happening very soon because their mandate does not have them interested in subnational forecasts. Now, um, moving toward a frame. So I think that the people who are doing subnational forecasts use something like a multi-state model. Um, which is um, you know, kind of cohort component-ish. But um, the biggest problem is getting the migration flows in those data sets, to be honest, not the, not the uh, natural increase flows. Yeah, So same um, in the US, I think. Yes, exactly. And so, um, but which is where like thinking about introducing um, like a potentially other approaches and also using good data approaches to figure out what is like using something perhaps super simple like uh, you know, child woman ratio, which pretty much is available everywhere. And then maybe course migration statistics could get you um, course migration flows. I mean, I do think there's a message here for people who do data collection, um, which is that we need better statistics on, you know, spatially delimited statistics on, um, particularly on migration, but um, also on 
So that's that's a, that's a takeaway from this. So, and I think those methods do tend to have, if where it's done, they usually are connected to the national level forecast in some way, but sometimes it's just an as an adjustment factor, not yeah. as a, um, not in the necessarily a coupled model. So, but yeah, if we had subnational population forecasts, I, I would say we'd be like two thirds the way to thinking about city forecasts. Like that would be a way better than, but, um, and you might ask, why am I interested in the city growth stuff rather than the subnational forecasts? And I think that the climate stuff really places a lot of burden for cities to get their act together and to think about, you know, or for not just cities, like cities and whole, you know, and for us to pay attention to how cities are changing and, um, and um, rather than just treating it as urban fractions. Um, so um, I think that the climate, the climate piece of it, it does really happen in a particular place and the subnational, even a subnational forecast would um, go a long way, but it would still um, pave over a lot of the important heterogeneity that you find in cities and cities are probably increasingly becoming places on inequality. You don't wanna pave that stuff over if you don't have to, so. Okay, thank you so much, Deborah. Wonderful talk.